Hello everyone. In this lecture, we discuss the role of costs in pricing. In the 1980s, a publisher of specialized books faced the following situation. The book sells for $20 per copy, and the cost was $16 per copy. The contribution to the overhead and the profit is therefore $4 per copy. On the first run, the publisher prints 2,000 books. Only half of these books were sold after one year, so there were 1,000 books left. What would the publisher do with the 1,000 leftovers? The publisher invited a pricing consultant, and the consultant's suggestion was to drop the price to $10. Fire sale. Let's move the books quickly. And the publisher was like, are you crazy? My production cost was $16. How can I make money if I sell the books at $10? The more I sell, the more I lose. What do you think about the pricing consultant's suggestion? Pause the video and think about your answers. The key to this case lies in the role of costs in pricing. There are different types of costs. The question is, what type of costs are relevant and what type of costs are not? First, the book production cost, $16 per copy. Is this cost relevant to our pricing decisions for the leftover books? Well, actually, it is not. The production cost is what we call a sunk cost. A sunk cost is the type of cost that, no matter what you do in the future, you cannot recoup this cost. So after the books are printed, there's no way of recouping this cost. So this $16 per copy is irrelevant to our pricing decisions. It's a sunk cost. Well. If this is irrelevant, what are the costs that are relevant? We can think of at least two other costs. One is inventory cost. When you have leftover books, you have to store those books. The second type of relevant cost is easy to miss. It is the capital cost, the cost of money on the production. As I mentioned earlier, the case happened in the early 1980s when the U.S. was incurring runaway inflation, and the interest rate was 20% per year. Businesses like the book publisher, they operate on bank loans. And if you borrow money from the bank, and the cost of money is 20% interest, let's take a look at how fast this capital cost compounds. $16, 20% interest rate. After one year, it becomes $19.2, and the interest cost is $3 after year one. And similarly, if you compound this borrow the money all the way, the interest cost rose from $3 to $7 to $12 to $17. It quickly approaches the listing price of the book at $20. So, if you could significantly lower the price of the book and push it out in one year, you actually would save $4 in interest rate. That is, selling the book one year faster is equivalent to selling the books at $4 more in price. The pricing decision actually influences the cost. So this case tells us it is very important to consider the type of costs that are relevant to our decision and the type of costs that can be avoided or changed when we make sound pricing decisions. The second case is on shale oil. A few years ago, when oil price tanked, I read in news reports, it says the cost of oil is $40 and the price of oil has dropped to $30. Shale oil is in huge trouble. Is this true? A shale oil fracking company has invested $20 million in equipment, which lasts 10 years before new equipment is needed. 
Its variable cost of drilling and production is $20 per barrel. Its wells produce 100,000 barrels a year. Now, crude oil price has dropped to $30 should the company continue its production. According to accounting, $20 million in equipment is depreciated into 10 years. So that's $2 million a year. And $2 million a year divided by 100,000 barrels. So that's $20 per barrel. So the $20 is fixed cost distributed to a per barrel basis. But what's going on from an operating standpoint when you have a price of $30 and a variable cost of $20? Your operating cash flow is actually positive. That is $30 minus $20 is $10. This $10 can actually be used for other purposes, for financing, you can pay down interest for overheads so you can pay for other fixed costs. In the meantime, the additional $20 from the depreciation is not an actual operating cost. The reason being, you either have already purchased the equipment, you are not currently paying this $20 per barrel, or you have used bank loan to purchase the equipment. Again, you are not paying this $20 per barrel cost, you are paying bank interest. So either way, as long as price is above variable cost, the shale oil companies are actually better off keep drilling because they are cash flow positive and they can still make money. In the meantime, is this situation sustainable over, let's say, a decade? It is not. As you can see, a long-term perspective and a short-term perspective, we are looking at very different situations. In the short term, in this cost structure, the shale oil operator should actually continue. Here is a similar example of TV shows. A TV channel has two different shows, and both shows, as you see in the table, have the same ad revenue of a million dollars, but their production expenses are different, $500,000, and $750,000. Therefore, the contribution to indirect expenses are different, half a million and a quarter million. The indirect expenses, such as utilities, buildings, equipment, they're not directly associated with an individual show, so they have to be distributed to different shows. Each show has $300,000. As a result, show A has a net profit of $200,000, and show B has a net loss of $50,000. Show A, at least for the time being, is obviously a keeper. The problem is, for show B, what should the TV channel do about it? This is very similar to the Shell Oil Operator example. That is, if you don't have a decent show to substitute for show B, show B actually is creating positive cash flow that can cover at least part of the indirect expense. If you remove show B without a good substitute, that $300,000 will not be covered at all. So in this case, you should find a better candidate to replace show B, but in the meantime, show B goes on. Our final example is on Netflix. Netflix started in 1997 as a DVD rental company. And over the first decade, Netflix bread and butter was DVD rental. So what Netflix used to do was Netflix would mail the DVDs to the customers with a prepaid envelope. And after customers watch the DVDs, they will put the DVDs back into the envelope and mail it back. Starting from 2008, Netflix started to move on to streaming business. With Netflix transition from DVD rental to streaming, we ask two questions. First, what has changed, especially in terms of cost structure? Second, what are the strategic implications on pricing? Let's examine the before scenario, DVD rental. Netflix mailed DVDs to customers. Customers watch the DVD and then return it. If we compare having one customer versus having hundreds of customers, how does the cost differ? Does the cost expand proportionally 
or does the cost stay the same? Of course, the cost has to change more or less proportionally, because in the DVD rental business, Netflix's main cost is the holding cost of DVDs, and with more customers, there will be more customers keeping the DVD when they're watching it. There will be more DVDs on the way back and forth. So the number of DVD holding for Netflix has to more or less increase proportionally with the number of customers. So in this situation, Netflix is mainly a variable cost-driven business. Its cost structure expands with its customer base proportionally. That situation has changed when Netflix moved to streaming, and and in streaming, the main cost is production and the delivery. It does not change all that much whether you have one customer or ten customers. For similar comparison, consider Microsoft. When it produces an operating system, it's mainly a fixed investment. The software costs very little to reproduce. Therefore, the cost of Netflix in streaming does not change much with the size of customer base. The interesting part in a fixed cost focal business is each additional customer that Netflix gains is almost pure profit because there's very little additional variable cost for each additional customer. And the larger the customer base there is, the more customer will be able to dilute the fixed cost structure. And the more profitable the company is, what is the implication of such cost structure change on customer acquisition? Should Netflix have more or less incentive to drop its subscription fee in the current streaming model? Pause the video and think about it. Given that Netflix is now a fixed cost focal business. It actually has less incentive to increase the subscription fee. The reason is increasing subscription fee risks losing customer because it does not incur high variable cost. Each additional customer is almost pure profit. Similarly, the fixed cost structure allows Netflix to expand internationally and charge much lower fee outside the United States. As you can see, cost structure itself. Although simple, just variable cost versus fixed cost, actually has big implications on the company's customer acquisition strategy. To recap, in this lecture, we have covered different types of costs and their implications on pricing. Specifically, we should not consider sunk cost in decision making, and we should examine different types of costs. In order to figure out whether they are relevant or irrelevant to our pricing decisions, capital cost is relevant. Book production cost is not. Oil drilling cost is relevant. Equipment depreciation is not, at least in the short term. TV show production cost is relevant. Indirect cost is less relevant. Finally, simple concepts like fixed. Versus variable costs have implications to the company's strategic decision-making process. That's our discussion on the role of costs in pricing. Thank you. I'll see you next time.